Hi, what I have here on the workbench today are some AA rechargeable batteries. Xstar, which is the company making these batteries, contacted me a few weeks ago asking me whether I wanted to review these batteries. At first I thought these were just some regular batteries, but upon closer look, these are actually 1.5 volts lithium ion rechargeable ones. For those who know a thing or two about batteries, you know that lithium ion chemistry for rechargeable batteries typically have a terminal voltage between around 3.7 and 4.2 volts. So obviously this battery has built in DC to DC converters to convert that voltage down from 3.7 to 1.5 volts. And I have seen some rechargeable AA lithium ion batteries on the market before. And because the batteries rely on DC to DC converters to step down the voltage to 1.5 volts, they typically have a separate charging mechanism. For instance, some brands like Kent have a ring which isolates from the tip and that ring serves as a charging terminal, so they require special chargers. Some brands incorporated USB charging ports into the batteries themselves and solve the charging issue that way. And the ones with built-in USB ports are fairly common these days. What strikes me about these XTAR batteries is that they look just like your regular batteries. There is no charging port and there is no separate terminal on the top. And if you look at the supply charger, you will see that there is nothing special. Basically the charging and discharging goes through the same terminals, as you can see here. They look just like your ordinary chargers. The negative terminals have two contacts, that's because this charger supports both AA and AAA charging. And you can see there is nothing special about the positive terminal, there is just one contact here. In fact, this charger is compatible with nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries as well, according to what is printed on the charger. As you can see here, not sure if you can read that, but it says right there. It's compatible with both 1.5 volts lithium ion and nickel metal hydride batteries. And I just wanted to show you the positive terminal of the battery again. You can see that we have this tip and then the ring is actually insulated. So there is no separate battery terminal on top. And that's why I wanted to get my hands on these batteries and the charger so I could take a closer look. I think I do have some idea on how the charging and discharging works on this battery. And by the way, if you are interested in getting yourself these batteries, I will provide the link in the video description below. I'm going to test the discharging characteristics of the batteries in this video and we'll open one up later to see the electronics inside and figure out how it works. But before we dive into details, let's take a look at the specifications provided by the manufacturer. The battery capacity is rated at 2.5 amp hours. Theoretically speaking, lithium batteries rated capacity is not influenced much by the discharge rate. But given that we have a DC to DC converter built in, the efficiency of the DC to DC converter definitely varies with the load. So I would be interested to see the actual usable capacity under different load conditions. According to XTAR's website, the charging time is just under 3 hours, which is pretty good. Now the specified capacity is a little bit confusing. If I take the 1.5 volts voltage and the 2.5 amp hour capacity number, I get 3.75 watt hours, not the 4.15 watt hours that is given. Anyway, one of the main benefits of using a DC to DC converter to step down the voltage is that they can regulate the voltage and make the voltage almost constant during the discharging cycle. And you can clearly see this in the chart provided by XTAR. For most of the applications, the constant output voltage has little to no benefit at all because most of the electronics have their own voltage converters and regulators built in. There are actually some drawbacks to this regulated output approach. Some electronics, especially those use AA batteries, have some kind of a meter built in and depends on the measured battery voltage, it tells you the approximate runtime left. Because the XTAR batteries essentially output 1.5 volts until the very end, the runtime gauge would no longer work, and you would run into a situation where one minute the battery appears to be full and the next minute it is totally drained. Now, one benefit of this constant voltage output is for applications such as flashlights, especially the cheap ones as they do not have built-in regulators, and the light output would go dimmer as time goes by with your typical batteries, but not for these XTAR batteries due to the built-in voltage regulation. Here are some more detailed specifications. If you take a look at the charging voltage, you will see that it's specified as 5 volts. So this is the first clue to the charging mechanism. Let's actually take a look. So let's take a look at the battery charger provided by XR. 
and here I have a battery that is completely drained that I tested earlier. So let's take a look at the terminal voltage here. And you can see it's 1.1 volts as the spec specified. So let's put it in. And you can see that we started charging. And by the way, not sure if you can see here, there is an indicator light that tells you the battery is being charged on the battery itself, which is really nice. And let's actually measure the voltage. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit messy here, but just stay with me. So I wanted to see the voltage here. And you can see right now we're at 3.5 volts. So clearly that is higher than the voltage of the battery. So clearly the charger operates at a much higher voltage. And now if I put a semi-charged battery in, let's take a look. And let's measure the terminal voltage again. you'll see that it's actually closer to five volts. So that's the quoted five volts charging voltage. So definitely this is different than your typical charger, which charges at roughly the same voltage as your battery. Whereas here, we're charging at a much higher voltage. To understand how the charging works, I hooked up a variable power supply. I have two meters set up. One meter measures output voltage of the battery and the other meter measures the charging current. Right now you can see that there is no charging current going into the battery and we're measuring roughly 1.5 volts at the terminal here. And that voltage is the nominal voltage of the battery. So let me gradually increase the output voltage from the power supply and let's observe what the current meter says. You can see that right now we're at 2.5 volts. There's still no current flowing in. Let me go down, let's see, roughly at 3.5 volts, we started seeing the charging current. And let's increase it to 5 volts. So we can see that the charging current is around 450 milliamps. So as you can see here, this battery does not charge like your typical rechargeable AA battery. And this battery requires much higher terminal voltage doing charging. So most likely you wouldn't be able to recharge these batteries while the batteries are still in circuit. So using a higher voltage to charge is actually a very clever way to duplexing the charging and discharging port. One way to implement this is like this. Here we have a lithium ion cell which outputs say 3.7 volts. And then we have a DC to DC converter that converts the voltage down to 1.5 volts for the output. And output, we have a diode, so that during discharge, the current flows through the diode here. And this diode can be a regular diode or a MOSFET, which offers lower voltage drop. Anyway, on the other side of the diode, we have a separate circuitry that is used for detecting the input voltage. Because we have a diode here, when the external voltage exceeds the DC to DC converter output, the current actually does not flow back through this diode. It only flows one direction out. So here on the separate route, we have this charging circuitry and it monitors the input voltage. At a certain point, it will turn on the switch, which allows the current to flow through the charging route into the battery. And this is the control circuitry that monitors the output and is on the other side of the diode so that it monitors the input voltage instead of the output from the DC to DC converter. So that's pretty much exactly what we saw. When the input voltage to the battery exceeds a certain threshold, the charging is enabled. Now, of course, this is just one of the many different ways to make this work with a shared anode. In this case, the anode is right here, and this is the cathode, the, the battery. When we open up the battery later, we should be able to find out more. But the basic principle of operation should be very similar to what we're looking at here. Now, Let's take a look at some discharging characteristics. Because the battery has a built-in DC to DC converter, we should be able to see the switching noise when the battery is being discharged. Now let's just take a look at the setup here. Here I have a battery holder, and the reason I use this is because it's easier for me to clip on to these leads, and there's no battery inside just yet. 
Through this battery holder, I have two cables that is hooked up with this dummy load. Here I have a 2.5 ohm, four of the 10 ohm resistors in parallel, and that should give you a discharge current of roughly 600 milliamps through 1.5 volts. And at the same time, the mixic oscilloscope in the background is monitoring the AC ripple across the load resistor here. You can see we set to 20 millivolts per division and it's in AC coupling. So let me put the battery in. And you can immediately see the ripple here. And this is due to the switching nature of the DC to DC converter. And you can see the ripple is roughly 40 millivolts from peak to peak. So let's actually take a look at the switching frequency here. So we're roughly talking about, let's just, uh, let's stop this here to, let's do here. So it's roughly 3.8 megahertz switching frequency. And let's just take a look at the peak to peak value here. So let's do here and here. So we're talking about 3540 millivolts. And just for comparison, let's take a look at the discharging waveform with a regular battery here. So let's start it and turn off the cursors. Let me disconnect the battery here. And let's put in a regular battery. And you can see that with a regular battery, essentially we do not get any ripple. Some of the noise is actually from the environment being picked up by the probe. And now I just remove the battery. You can see we still have a little bit of noise here and there. That's just from the environment. So one advantage of powering your devices with batteries is that the power source is very clean. And this is actually much desired in a lot of applications, especially for analog preamps. The switching noise from these kind of batteries make them unsuitable for those sensitive applications. So switching noise is something you need to think about when using this kind of batteries. And now let's get a sense of the discharging characteristics of the battery. For this test, I'm using the Miniware MDP L1060 electronic load. I did a review on this electronic load a few weeks ago, and you can check it out if you are interested. So at the moment, the electronic load is off. You can see the terminal voltage measured is 1.5 volts. So let's actually turn on the electronic load. You can see here, I set it to 100 milliamps right now. And let me enable the electronic load. So now we're joining 100 milliamps. So let me increase the current here. And now we're joining about 200 milliamps. And now we're joining 400 milliamps. You can see the voltage dropped a little bit more. And now we're at one amp, as you can see, and the voltage did drop a little bit, but actually let me try to measure it from the terminal here. So I don't think the voltage actually dropped this much as we are actually connecting to the metal plates here, not at the terminal directly. So let me use another multimeter here to measure. And let's uh, put it here. Let's measure directly from the battery terminal here. And you can see we're still measuring 1.5 volts. So yeah, so let's, for the time being, just ignore this multimeter. That just tells you the approximate voltage here. Now let me increase the current draw directly to the maximum rated 2 amps current here. And you can see we don't have any issues. And I'm actually let it run for a few minutes and we'll take a look at the thermal signature. So you can see we're approaching 60 degrees already. So that's actually pretty hot. Now let me take a picture so I can overlay it onto the video. Now let me keep increasing the current draw to see how far we can push the maximum here. So now we're at 2 amps. So let me increase the current to 2.1 amp. And it looks like we're still holding up. 
Let's uh, increase it to 2.2 amps. And we're looking okay. Let's further increase it to 2.3. It looks okay. Let's do 2.4. It is still holding up. All right, so let me increase it to 2.5. Nope. You can see that 2.5 doesn't seem like we're able to sustain that voltage and it gets cut out once in a while, as you can just see there. So let me actually reduce it to 2.4 amps. And that appears we are able to sustain that output. So this is a 2.4 amps. And let's take a look at the battery temperature here. Oh my goodness, it's at 75 degrees and it's still rising. So let me take a picture here. So it's actually getting a little bit uncomfortably warm at 2.4 amps. So let's reduce it to 2 amps. And that's our maximum rated discharge current. So we're definitely able to push the maximum discharge current a little bit but the controller circuitry just gets very, very hot. Also, I did some testing earlier using different discharge rate after the battery had been fully charged. And it seems that the maximum capacity I got was below two amp hours instead of the rated 2.5 amp hours. When discharged at one amp, the total capacity measured was roughly at 1.76 amp hours. And when discharged at 500 milliamps, the total capacity was slightly better at 1.85 amp hours. When I discharged the battery at 2 amps though, I was only able to get around 1 amp hour out of the battery. Now, as you can see, I set a cutoff to 0.9 volts instead of 1.1 volts because there was significant voltage drop across the wires to the electronic load. There is still some capacity left, and you can see that after I disconnected the load, the battery recovered to 1.5 volts, but I wasn't able to run the load at 2 amps any longer. So I'm not entirely sure how they derived that 2.5 amp hour capacity as I wasn't able to get anywhere close to that. The best I can get is at 1.8 amp hours with a discharge current of 500 milliamps. And that 1.8 amp hour number is similar to what you would get with a nickel metal hydride battery. So I opened up one of the batteries after it has been fully discharged. And by the way, this is important to avoid battery burst into flames if it gets accidentally shorted during the assembly. From what you can see here, essentially the circuit board for the DC to DC converter and charging circuitry is inside this plastic case, which sits on top of this battery. Now, this is a shortened version of the standard battery. The plastic ring is about six millimeters in height, which means 12% of the volume is taken by the converter and charging circuitry instead of the battery cell. So this means the battery capacity is sacrificed by at least 12%. The circuitry seems to be highly integrated and everything is handled in that tiny QFN chip back there. There are markings on the chip, but I was not able to find any corresponding data sheet. Anyway, what you can see here is that we do have this shocky diode, and now this is on the negative side of the circuitry instead of the positive as I drew earlier, so let's actually buzz it out. So this is a negative. Let's see if it's connected. Yeah. You can see this side is connected directly to the negative terminal. So yeah, so this is slightly different than what I illustrated before, but the general idea is the same. In this case, the diode is on the cathode side of the battery instead of the anode side of the battery, like what I drew before. So let's take a look at the other side. And by the way, when I was taking the board out, I applied a little bit too much force to the board. You can see that the LED here was yanked off but the board should still be fully functional, except for the LED display. So let me actually hook it up to see what the quiescent current draw is. And it should give us an idea 
of how long the battery would last on standby without being charged due to the current draw from the DC to DC converter here. As you can see, the standby current is only at 18 microamps, which is actually very low. So the battery self-discharging should not be a major concern here. Anyway, that concludes my review of the X-Star rechargeable lithium-ion AA battery. In my opinion, the concept of this battery is good, but the delivery fell a little bit short in terms of capacity and discharging current. The ripple noise is another factor that limiting its use but it can be useful in some applications. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching and I will catch up with you next time.